The conference program says that we're supposed to be openly exploring the quantum state as a reality. Um, and you may be aware that there's been quite a lot of work recently about attempts to prove that the quantum state must be real. Um, so what I really want to do in this talk is give you an overview of that work and uh, where, it's, where it's going now. Um, if you've read my abstract, you'll have read various grandiose claims about connections to cohesion specter contextuality. I'm not sure that we'll actually get to that in this talk, um, but you can ask me about it later. Um, okay, so um, let's start by establishing a bit of terminology, sort of philosophical terminology. Um, so an ontic state uh, is a state of reality. That's something that if you wiped out all of the intelligent life in the universe, would still exist. It's the stuff that's really out there. Um, so the psiontic view is the view that the quantum state is such a thing. There really are quantum states out there in some sense. Um, on the other hand, uh, an epistemic state is a state of knowledge or information, and the psi-epistemic view is the view that the quantum state is such a thing. Um, so you may still be a little bit confused about that, but let's just look at the example of classical physics where the distinction's very clear. Um, so classically, if we consider a Newtonian particle in one dimension, its ontic state is just a point in phase space, uh, because if you specify the position and momentum of the particle, then all of the objective properties that it has are just functions of that, right? So it's energy you would calculate uh, from the phase space point. Um, on the other hand, an epistemic state is something like a spread out probability distribution. Um, here I've just drawn some contour lines because my 3D plotting skills aren't that great. Uh, but the idea is that uh, the system really does have a definite phase space point at all times, and this spread out distribution just represents the fact that we're uncertain about where it is. Um, so the question of whether the quantum state is ontic or epistemic, I want to formulate it like this. Um, is the quantum state something more like this, or is it something more like that? Um, if we go back to the founders of quantum theory, um, in the, the early days, the psi-epistemic view was quite popular. Um, people like um, Schrodinger and de Broglie initially wanted to view the quantum state as uh, a real physical wave, but they quickly were made to change their minds on that, so it's difficult to find quotes supporting that view. Um, but certainly, um, as we saw in Jan's talk, there are, certain, there are certain issues on which Bohr and Einstein agree, and this is one of them. Uh, they both believed in the psi-epistemic point of view, uh, but for very different reasons. So Bohr thought that the whole task of uh, physics is to, is to just, it's just all about what we can say about nature. So the whole entire physical apparatus of physical theories is a description of what we can know or what we can say. Um, Einstein was famous for the um, ensemble view of the quantum state. Um, and you might say, well, what has that got to do with knowledge or information? This is really just a matter of terminology. Um, the, the terminology epistemic is sort of suggestive of a broadly Bayesian interpretation of probability theory. That's the terminology that people use. It's not really the point at issue here, right? It's, is, is the quantum state something more phase space point-like or probability distribution-like. So if you're, for example, a frequentist about probability, then you're going to talk about ensembles and statistical states instead of uh, epistemic states. But from this point of view, it means the same thing. Um, of course, Einstein thought that there was some deeper underlying reality, and that's the thing that distinguishes him from uh, Bohr. Um, so we can broadly classify interpretations of quantum theory uh, in terms of this issue, whether they're psi-epistemic and psiontic, but also on more traditional lines as to whether they're realist or, uh, or anti-realist. So does there need to be some deeper reality underlying quantum physics? So all of the Copenhagen-ish type ideas, including modern variants like uh, quantum Bayesianism, go in this uh, quadrant here. Um, most of the realist interpretations you've ever heard of, including things like Bohmian mechanics, many worlds, they take the quantum state literally as at least part of the description of reality. Um, and then over here, we have at the moment just a list of names. So Einstein, um, I would argue that Ballantyne's statistical interpretation is at least compatible with this view, and Rolf Speckens has been arguing for it uh, quite strongly in recent years. 
Um, there are no fully worked out interpretations over here. And so the question that's really addressed by the more, most recent work is, does this position make sense? Can you be both realist and cyberstemic? Up here, of course, is an oxymoron. This is a contradiction, because if you're anti-realist, then you can't be, if you think that you know, nothing is real, then the quantum state can't be in particular. OK, so before we go further, we should ask the question, well, why would you want to be cyberstemic in the first place? And I'll just give you one reason here. There's one, this reason is particularly important for the line of work um, that's gone from this. So if we look at the phase space, classical phase space example again, where I've collapsed it down to one dimension in order that I can draw two different probability distributions, um, you can see that different probability distributions can overlap with one another, right? So in particular, if somebody prepared a system according to this distribution or according to this distribution uh, and then asked you which of those two had happened, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell with certainty because with some probability you'd end up in the overlap region. And when that happens, um, your probability of guessing which of the two is less than, what, is less than one. Okay, so the idea here is that if quantum states are something more like probability distributions, then we can explain the fact that they're indistinguishable, that there's no quantum measurement that can, um, that can determine between two of them with certainty, um, by the fact that sometimes the state of reality when you prepare psi1 or psi2 is actually exactly the same. Okay, so I want you, this is called the psi epistemic explanation of indistinguishability, and this is what I want you to have in mind for, what, for the rest of what I'm going to say. Of course, um, there are other reasons for being psi epistemic, such as how to understand the collapse of the wave function, but, and those are equally important, but this is the one I want you to have in mind. Okay, so if uh, we're going to prove theorems about these things, we need a mathematical framework in which to do that. That's called the ontological models framework. It's nothing uh, that fancy. It's just really the same framework that John Bell was using to prove his well-known theorem. Um, so in this talk, we're only going to consider the most uh, simple quantum experiment imaginable. A system is prepared, a finite dimensional system in some pure state, and then immediately afterwards, it's measured in some orthonormal basis. Okay, and then quantum mechanics supplies the probabilities given by the mod squared in the product. So this is the description of uh, what you will observe in the lab when you do this experiment. We want to posit the idea that there might be some, uh, some actual uh, objective physical properties that the system possesses between preparation and measurement. So following John Bell, we're going to call those lambda. Um, and then uh, the idea is that when you make a preparation, that doesn't necessarily completely control the underlying state of reality. So in general, uh, when you prepare the system in a state psi, you get some probability measure over, over the space of lambdas. And similarly, we don't want to assume determinism. There could still be some genuine stochasticity in nature. So for each value of lambda, and here I've done uh, the example of a two outcome measurement, for each value of lambda, for each measurement, uh, there has to be a probability distribution over the results. So we end up with a collection of functions like this that have to sum to one everywhere because uh, every experiment should have some outcome. Okay, so then in this kind of model, you will compute the probabilities that you observe in the lab by averaging these measurement probabilities over your uncertainty about the true um, ontic state. Okay. And uh, you want this model to reproduce the quantum predictions, so this should equal this. So that's, that's basically the whole formalism. OK, so within this formalism, we can now formalize what it means for the quantum state to be real. So first of all, we say that two quantum states are ontologically distinct in such a model if, well, basically just want you to look at this picture. The corresponding probability distribution should have no overlap. OK, so remember, um, we're interested in explaining the indistinguishability of quantum states in terms of overlap. So this is the, this is the issue that we're interested in. Whereas over here, we have the case of uh, ontological indistinguishability. OK, so, uh, so this is the case where you could potentially explain um, indistinguishability in terms of overlap. So then an ontological model is said to be psiontic if every pair of states is like this, if there's no overlaps at all. Otherwise, it's called psi epistemic. Uh, 
Um, and bear in mind that this is a very weak definition of uh, what you might mean by psi-epistemic because it places no bounds on how large the overlap has to be. Right? So you could have a model in which only a single pair of states has any overlap, and the overlap was very tiny. That would still satisfy this definition. So later on, we're going to be interested in looking at refinements of that. OK, so then um, in the literature, uh, since about 2011, you'll find various theorems which aim to have as their conclusion that an ontological model must be psiontic. The Pussy barrett rudolph theorem is the most famous one, um, but there are others, and I've written a long review article about all of this. So I'll give you the reference at the end. Uh, the only point I want to make about these here is that in addition to the bare framework that I just discussed, each of these theorems makes some additional assumptions about things like, for example, how subsystems are supposed to compose in the theory. And those assumptions have been criticized. There are varying degrees of plausibility. So we would, in, in uh, principle, like to find out what happens if you don't have to make any additional assumptions. OK. Well, then you find that there are um, ontological models that are psi-epistemic. So for a qubit, a two-dimensional quantum system, Koshin and Specker back in 1967, uh, came up with such a model. I don't want to go through the details now, but the point is that when you have two non-orthogonal states, they correspond to probability distributions that overlap by quite some amount. OK, so we know that that's possible. Um, but qubits are kind of special. Can we do this for uh, other kinds of quantum systems? Uh, and it turns out that you can. You can do it for all finite dimensional systems. And you can even come up with a model where every pair of non-orthogonal pure states corresponds to overlapping probability distributions. However, this isn't really the end of the story, because um, remember, we want to explain indistinguishability in terms of overlap. Um, and what happens in these models is if you take a pair of states with a fixed inner product, that means that the indistinguishability is fixed. And you look at what happens as you increase the Hilbert space size then the uh, overlap of the corresponding probability measures goes uh, down and down. It gets smaller and smaller. Um, so at some point, uh, there's not going to be enough overlap to explain the indistinguishability. So although there are psi-epistemic models by this sort of, by the stronger criterion of is there enough overlap to explain the indistinguishability, uh, these kind of models are going to fail that. So the question that people have been asking more recently is, does this necessarily have to happen? Um, OK, so what we want to do is uh, come up with some bounds on the amount of overlap in an ontological model. And for that, we need some, a measure of the amount of overlap. And this is the one uh, that's been used in most of the work. Uh, roughly speaking, if you look at the picture, it's just uh, if you draw two probability distributions representing your probability measure, then it's sort of the joint area under both of the graphs. Right, this is the formal uh, measure theoretic definition up here. Um, the thing about this is it has a good operational uh, motivation. So suppose somebody prepares the state psi or phi, and you don't know which. Um, if, by some miracle, you were able to know the exact ontic state of the system, so bear in mind we don't usually know this because this is like the underlying reality and you can only actually do quantum measurements. But if you know somebody came and told you this is the actual lambda, then this is the probability, the optimal probability with which you'd be able to distinguish the two states. It's related to the overlap in this way. Um, so we want to compare that with the corresponding quantum measure. Um, so here we basically just look at the same quantity, where instead of optimizing over what you can do if you know the ontic state, you optimize over all quantum measurements. Right? So with this quantity here, the optimal success probability of distinguishing psi and phi with a quantum measurement is related to the quantum overlap in this way. And uh, you can actually do this optimization, and it works out to this quantity here. Um, for those of you who know these things, this overlap measure is just 1 minus the quantum trace distance. So this is just uh, coming from the formula for the trace distance. OK, so then uh, what, what people have done is, uh, is uh, develop bounds that work like this. So if you take some set V of quantum states and some other set of quantum states, then they, uh, they've looked at the average overlap between psi and the states in this set. Okay, 
Uh, because this is an average, you know that there's at least one pair of states in this set that has an overlap as small as, as, small as this. So if you don't like averages, you can view it as a, as, as a bound on an individual pair of states. Then uh, most people have used this to then write down a bound on the ratio of the average classical overlap to the average quantum overlap. So this one on the bottom here, we can just calculate because we have the formula here. The hard piece is getting a bound on, on this thing. Um, however, so there are many sets of states that people have found for which this ratio uh, goes to zero. Um, however, uh, this isn't really what we want, I would argue, uh, because what you want in order to make psi epistemic interpretations look uh, bad is to find sets of states which have large quantum overlap, so are fairly indistinguishable uh, by quantum measurements, yet have very, very small classical overlap. Um, so this doesn't do that because you can, in fact, have states which have very small quantum overlap so long as the classical overlap's a lot smaller. So you're only really saying things about states that are almost distinguishable anyway with this measure. Um, and that's actually what happens with the sets of states people have looked at. So uh, I've more recently been looking at uh, bounding this uh, overlap deficit. And if you can find that this is close to one, then you've made cyberstemic uh, in interpretations look implausible. OK, so uh, here are basically some families. Th these are the results from some families of states that people have found. Um, they, uh, they are constructions that exist in, with various constraints on the dimension of Hilbert space, various numbers of states in the set. So in these two cases, the uh, number of states depends on the dimension of the Hilbert space. Here it's a separate parameter. In each dimension, there's a construction with different numbers of states. These are, this is the hard part, is to get these classic bounds on the classical overlap, and then you calculate the quantum overlap. So uh, I just recently uh, optimized the dimension, uh, the parameters here, to find out where you get the largest overlap deficit, and these are the results of doing that. So um, in particular, a set of states that I proposed using an analysis that uh, Cyril Brankyard did, not the same analysis that was in my paper, you find that the largest overlap we've managed to find is somewhere around, the largest overlap difference is somewhere about 0 0.4, and that happens when you have 16 states in a five-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, Actually, uh, Martin, in a minute, is going to tell you about experiments that were done on this particular uh, construction. And as you can see, it's not the best one in terms of uh, overlap deficit. And uh, you only get this result here asymptotically as the number of states goes to infinity. To be fair, if you have about 100 states or so here, um, you're going to get something very close to this. Uh, but still, that's out of the experimentally practical region. Um, so, in a moment, Martin is going to tell you about the experiments which uh, they were aimed at bounding this ratio. As you can see, uh, they, did, they got uh, something less than one, but we're still a fair ways from zero. And the overlap deficit they found in their experiment it was this, which is a fair way away from what we know is uh, achievable. So, uh, I'm recommending that they should do an experiment on this set of states. Um, how much time do I have left? minutes. OK. Um, right. So what I'd like to do in the last, uh, last few minutes or so, is that including questions, by the way? Or? No, we have time for questions. OK. Um, so I've got a bit of time to explain to you where these kind of results come from. Um, so uh, I'll do that. So um, it turns out that although it wasn't always recognized at the time these results were derived, you can derive them all from cauchy specker contextuality. And all these overlap bounds are derived from contextuality inequalities. So uh, let me briefly uh, review for you what uh, cauchy specker contextuality is. We start by defining the opposite, which is non-contextuality. Um, so suppose you have some set of orthonormal bases, um, and we're only interested in reproducing the outcomes of this particular set of bases. Um, so a model is called cauchy specker non-contextual if it's outcome deterministic. So in particular, that means all of these conditional probabilities are either 0 or 1. And then also uh, what's called measurement non-contextual. So if you have two bases that include the same basis vector, uh, 
Um, so at, for example, in a real three-dimensional Hilbert space, if you have something, uh, a triple like this, and a triple where you rotate around this axis, then this basis vector will be in both bases. Um, then uh, these probability functions for that particular outcome are supposed to be the same. Now, you can debate the merits of this uh, definition, but um, what we're going to use it here for is as a sort of technical condition that ena enables us to prove overlap bounds. Now, actually, uh, this isn't really the best definition to use, uh, like if your interest is in sort of probabilistic models, because you always have to worry about measure zero sets where things go a bit haywire, right? So if you had non-contextual sets on, that were measure zero according to all the probability distributions in the model, you wouldn't care about that. Um, so I prefer to use this definition, which is uh, more or less equivalent. Um, so first of all, for every uh, measurement basis and every outcome, you can define the set of states in your model that uh, return probability one when you make that measurement. Um, we're not here yet assuming that the whole model is outcome deterministic or anything like that. Um, then you can define the set that return that value non-contextually. So by which I mean that you take the intersection of these sets for all the bases that include that state. Okay, so this is the set of states that always give you that measurement outcome regardless of how you measure it. Uh, then the existence of a cauchy spec and non-contextual model uh, is, turns out to be equivalent to the existence of a model where the entire probability comes from this set. Okay, so really when people talk about measuring non-contextuality in the lab or contextuality in the lab or bounding it, they, what they're actually doing is providing a bound on the size of this, uh, this uh, measure of this set here. Okay. Um, okay, so um, if you have some finite set of states, uh, then a non-contextuality inequality is any bound uh, of this form, so some bound on the, on the sum of these, non the measure of these non-contextual parts. Um, and then what you can prove is that the classical overlap is bounded by this non-contextual part. So that means any non-contextuality inequality uh, can be used to derive an overlap bound. Okay, so how long have I I've got now? Five minutes. Okay, so I can probably tell you something. I'll go beyond the end here. Uh, I can probably tell you something a bit more about uh, how that's derived. Okay, so this was the measure theoretic definition of the overlap. In particular, we're taking an infimum over all possible sets. So I can just stick in a set to get an upper bound. So if I stick in the set lambda A, I'll get this. Um, however, okay, I haven't shown you that yet. Uh, right. So, um, okay, so you've got some set of states V which are summing over here. If you consider a, a set of bases that covers that set, by which I mean if there's a pair of states in V that are orthogonal, then there should be a basis in M that includes both of them. Okay, so if V is finite, there'll be a finite set of covering bases. Your model has to reproduce the quantum probability that if you prepare A and then measure it, you always get probability one. And since this is a probability function here, it's less than or equal to one. And because this is a probability measure, it will integrate to one. So in order for this, to, this whole expression to integrate to one, this has to be entirely concentrated on the set which assigns probability one in that measurement. So this implies that this is a measure one set, but then that non-contextual um, set of states is an intersection of a finite number of these states, because there's a finite number of measurements. So that's also a measure one set. Okay, so going back to here, uh, we had this expression. This is the complement of a measure one set, so it's measure zero, and hence you get that result. Right, so anything you know about a contextuality inequality um, can be used to derive overlap bounds. Okay, so the, the methods that we use to derive these overlap bounds um, either come from standard contextuality inequality um, uh, results, or it also turns out that people have accidentally, when they were doing these overlap bounds, invented new contextuality inequalities. So we also get contextuality inequalities which have tighter bounds from what was uh, known before. Uh, but I don't have time to go, to go into the details of that. Uh, so let me go back to the end of the talk. Um, okay, so um, we now have several bounds showing this overlap ratio must go to zero. It's 
been harder to get this close to 1. Best bound is about 0 0.4. Um, any non-contextuality inequality gives you an overlap bound. And uh, it turns out the methods developed to bound overlaps give you new contextuality inequalities. Um, some things which are still open uh, is we need to do an error analysis for arbitrary versions of these proofs. It's been done for certain classes of these proofs, but not all of them. We want to show experimental robustness so that when you go into the lab and do a, a measurement, um, you, you actually get something out of that. We don't yet know what's the best possible bound. We'd like this to be close to one. Um, and I don't have time, but uh, people have begun to think about ap applications in quantum information theory. Uh, in the last minute, perhaps, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm go I want to sort of look at the more conceptual question, uh, what should you do now if you still want to be a psi epistemicist, as some of us do at least. Um, so you're always going to have the option of becoming a neo-Copenhagen type of person, because you know, if you're anti-realist, then nobody can force you by any theorem to believe in the reality of something. Um, but if you want to be a realist, then um, it's looking like you need to adopt some kind of more exotic ontology that doesn't fit into the standard ontological models framework that I was talking about. So these are some things that uh, people have been proposed um, seriously or not seriously by various people. Um, I think they're worth looking at. Um, the reason I think they're worth looking at is that if you have a quantum phenomenon that has a very natural explanation in a class of theories, and you should bear in mind here that there are sort of, although the whole of quantum mechanics can't be sort of psi epistemic, um, there are very nice sort of sub theories of quantum theory, including all of Gaussian quantum mechanics, which have extremely natural psi epistemic interpretations. Um, so if there's a natural explanation for something, you should try to in adopt it in your interpretation rather than throwing everything out and and starting again. So this, to me, suggests that we should try to explore these exotic ontologies, which, um, which, allow for, which would allow for psi epistemic point of view to still survive. OK, so I'll just finish with a reference slide. This is basically everything I've written on this topic. In particular, if you're a masochist, you can read this extremely long review article I wrote. Um, this is a much shorter review article, which also talks about um, some other phenomena within uh, ontological models. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat>